All right, so we've had now 40 to 50 years of more in-depth exploration of the giant planets in our own solar system. That's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And we've learned a lot about how atmospheres operate in general um, that have applications to exoplanets, not just the giant planets, but also the, the terrestrial planets and the mini Neptunes. I was going to say super Earths, but after Ravi, I'll say mini Neptunes um, that we can learn from. So I will start this. The first is something that uh, Ravi talked a lot about. It, and lesson one is that condensation matters. And so I'll try to use, I guess I can use a pointer. I don't have a lapel mic, so. All right, so um, here on this axis is depth in the atmosphere, and on this axis is um, temperature. So it's couched in terms of the, the brown door sequence, but these are just hotter uh, giant planets if you go out in this direction. Um, condensation will remove elements from above it. So you, it's hard once you condense something in a cloud to get those cloud particles up more than a, a few scale heights. And so you lose those elements once you condense. So the standard thermochemical equi equilibrium cloud sequence for a giant planet that has a solar-like composition, at, at very high temperatures deep in the atmosphere, you get the calcium titanium oxides, calcium alumina oxides, the more refractory stuff. And there's more oxygen than there is these other elements, so you lose the calcium, titanium, aluminum from the atmosphere. You don't see them higher up. Next thing that happens, you condense iron, which happens to be liquid under these conditions, magnesium silicates, sodium sulfide is a very important um, in terms of total mass phase for, for clouds. We do, we do have a lot of planets that are in this regime where, where this is higher up. Um, then salts like potassium chloride, other exotic salts. And finally, we get to the sequence where we can actually kind of probe with remote sensing observations. So the, the traditional picture is you have a water or water solution cloud here, um, ammonium hydrosulfide. And then depending on whether you have more nitrogen or sulfur in this, you have either an ammonia cloud, which you do on Jupiter and Saturn, or hydrogen sulfide like on Uranus and Neptune. Okay. But if you get hotter, this whole sequence moves up. And um, you now have in the regions that you're sensing remotely, you have the salts or you might have um, sodium sulfide. You get hotter and you have, you know, exotic silicate clouds, you know, in your troposphere at the top that you're sensing remotely. We do have a lot of exoplanets that are very, very hot. And even some of these will either have no clouds or they'll have the most refractory things um, on the night side. Um, like calcium titanium and oxides. And so keep in mind that when you're doing, looking at the chemistry of these things, you're only sensing these regions, you know, within and above the clouds. And in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, you only have methane. This is actually wrong. <laughs> I don't know who did this figure, but um, <laughs> on Jupiter, on Jupiter, methane is actually your dominant carbon phase all the way through the atmosphere. So there's CO not dominant here, but as you get hotter, CO will become the dominant carbon phase. And so you need to know the equilibrium composition to figure out what chemical species you have available to do the chemistry, and condensation will remove a lot of those. All right. So lesson two, uh, atmospheres are not in chemo uh, thermochemical equilibrium anywhere in the solar system. So that is a good first order guess of what molecules you have present but there are other processes that affect the, the composition. And one of these is something called transport-induced quenching. And so here we have, I'm losing this, I'll use my cursor, I think. Okay. Yes. All right, so here we have uh, pressure and abundance, um, volume mixing ratio, if you like. This is both pictures for Jupiter. There's a more carbon oxygen. This is the nitrogen. Um, the, da the dotted or the dashed are the equilibrium, thermochemical equilibrium predictions. Uh, as I said, methane is the dominant carbon species throughout. Water is the dominant oxygen species throughout. Um, there's a lot, of, lot more CO at depth when the temperatures are high, but in equilibrium, it would drop off significantly with altitude. And so in the regions that you're probing, 
you don't have much CO, and, but we do see CO. So there's this process called transport-induced quenching, and what happens there is that at depth, the temperatures are high and the reactions can occur equally well in both directions, and so you can kinetically maintain equilibrium. But as you transport, <coughs> excuse me, a parcel of gas upward, uh, at some point, it's colder and the reactions don't occur equally well in both directions. There's a high energy barrier, maybe in one direction. And so when the transport time scale drops below the chemical kinetic conversion time scale between uh, these different forms of the element, you can sort of freeze in that composition or quench it at there. And that everything gets quenched at that point. So the, the CO, uh, the water, and then the CH4 do. And there's also similar for, for case for nitrogen at different depths. So the point is, this is not particularly important on Jupiter, as you can see, because CO is, you know, part per billion level. We don't really care. We can just stick it in as a, a boundary condition in our, our models. But it, it matters a lot for brown dwarfs. Um, you can be in a regime where CO is dominant at depth, and you'd expect methane to be the dominant thing that you see at the, the higher atmospheric levels, but we see CO, and that's because of this process. And same with the young, directly imaged giant planets, exoplanets that we see, but also the hot Jupiters, this quenching process is gonna be very important. Another disequilibrium chemistry process is photochemistry, which of course occurs on all of the planets in our solar system. Um, for our giant planets, as I said, one of the main volatiles that's left that doesn't condense is uh, methane, and it even does condense on the colder Uranus and Neptune, but there's enough that gets into the stratosphere, makes it all the way up, interacts at the top of the stratosphere with extreme ultraviolet radiation, breaks it apart, forming these things, which form more hydrocarbons. The things in yellow have been seen on the giant planets. Methane sort of self-shields, so it's only uh, broken apart by, by shorter wavelength UV, so that it doesn't really participate in the chemistry in the troposphere. Longer wavelength UV gets down, affects phosphine and ammonia at the cloud tops. Um, they interact and form these other things, most of which condense actually, um, and might affect the cloud chromophores like on Jupiter. All right, so disequilibrium matters. Um, that's probably going to be true on exoplanets as well. Um, some of those molecules actually condense, you know, some of the more refractory things on Jupiter and Saturn, and some of the uh, more volatile things even on, on Uranus and Neptune that are very cold will condense to form hazes in, in the stratosphere. So there can be photochemical hazes. You know, an extreme example of that in our solar system, of, of course, is Titan. The main difference between Titan and Jupiter in terms of the sheer uh, mass of hazes forming is, is actually the background atmosphere. So on Titan, the background is N2. On the giant planets, it's H2. Um, methane is heavier than H2, but it's lighter than molecular nitrogen. So what happens on Titan is as you get into this region where the atmosphere is no longer well mixed and um, the molecular diffusion begins to dominate and the constituents are trying to separate out by weight. Uh, methane is lighter and actually increases with altitude into the thermosphere. There's a huge column over which it interacts with the, the solar UV, um, and ion chemistry is very important over this entire huge column. And so it's very easy to go through the sequence and build um, heavy, heavy molecules with very fast ion neutral chemistry. On, on the giant planets, the methane is heavier, so it actually falls off very sharply with altitude at a certain point, and that's where the EUV radiation hits, and you very have a very narrow region um, for this to happen. So in case you wondered why um, the giant planets have very thin hazes up and the Titan doesn't, that's it. All right, so lesson five. Photochemical species affect the spectra. Even though there, some of these are, you know, parts per million at best, going to parts per billion, they do have spectral features. We need to know that if we're looking at exoplanet spectra. Wrong thing. Sorry. So this is ethane, acetylene, very strong features. I think it's yeah, Saturn from Infrared Space Observatory. Um, even parts per billion type species produce 
spectra. You also see things in the UV that are photochemically produced. Um, so anyway, keep that in mind. Oh, gee, okay. Uh, because they're emitting, as you might expect, they're actually affecting the temperature structure. So photochemical species um, uh, turn out that, that ethane and acetylene are the dominant coolants in the stratospheres of the giant planets. Um, they could, the hazes contribute to heating. Uh, there's the, the thermospheres of the giant planets are very hot for reasons we don't understand. Uh, but H3 plus keeps them from being really hot because it emits as the temperature goes up, the emission increases and it cools from that. So there's, it's been called, uh, I think Steve Miller dumped, dubbed this the H3 plus thermostat on the thermospheres and it's interesting. Um, uh, as I mentioned, they do, giant planets do have warm stratospheres and very hot thermospheres for reasons we don't completely understand. The rate of transfer works well for, for Jupiter and Saturn, but on Uranus and Neptune, uh, this is temperature as a function of pressure. There's troposphere with convection dominates and then stratosphere, there's this inversion, very high for Neptune. Um, the, the hazes are not optically thick enough or dark enough to do this. There's not enough methane or actually solar flux to do it. So we don't know what heats the stratospheres on, on these planets. Thermospheres again <coughs> are very hot um, for reasons we don't know, but probably relates to um, dual heating from the currents that are, the, the magnetosphere uh, um, atmosphere interactions creates Pearson currents in, in the ionosphere, which may heat the atmosphere, but getting that heat to low latitude, low latitudes is, is problematic uh, in the model. So we still don't understand why thermospheres are hot. Um, and that's been dubbed the energy crisis on the outer planets. Okay. Um, they, giant planets do have magnetic, magnetic fields and that can affect the chemistry. There's an image I like of um, Saturn in uh, HST with, with the UV image superimposed over visible. You see the royal oval. Um, there are, here's another UV um, to visible images that show darker poles. I believe this is chemistry that's going on, kind of very Titan-like chemistry due to the influx of high energy magnetospheric particles. So that can happen on atmospheres. Um, atmospheres are not 1D, they're, they're 3D, and so the chemistry is not 1D. Um, there are seasonal effects that matter on our giant planets, uh, especially at higher altitudes. Things happen quickly and in response to solar flux. This is just season over here, uh, latitude here. Um, season L sub S of zero is, is northern vernal equinox, 90 is northern summer southern summer here. Um, Saturn's orbit is eccentric, so there's actually perihelion is closer to summer solstice. You can see the effect of the ring shadowing here. So basically, things happen quickly at high altitudes. So all the time scales are, are, are fast. Uh, you get phase lag as you go down in terms of the chemistry. It's really useful, for instance, for the Cassini data to compare the predictions with what you observe, and that tells you actually a lot about atmospheric circulation in, in a region of the atmosphere that has no clouds, so that's been very useful. Um, okay, uh, there's external material coming into these atmospheres, and this could be very important for exoplanets that are close to their host stars, because they're in sort of the gravitational potential well of, of their star, and so there's a strong gravitational focusing, the more material is coming in. So, on basically all the planets except for Uranus, we have an evidence for large cometary impacts within the last few hundred years. Um, also on uh, Saturn, Enceladus, there's water coming out of the plumes Enceladus that's making its way into Saturn's atmosphere, dust particles coming down, and so on. There, there seems to have been a very large impact on Neptune, very large in the last few hundred years. Um, and that evidence is both from the carbon monoxide that's, that's deep in the stratosphere. It's actually more abundant than these photochemical products of hydrocarbons. Also HCN and CS have been observed um, from OMA. Uh, wave activity also matters. So probably the single most important thing in terms of explaining differences in composition between say Uranus and Neptune or giant planets in general, is this thing called eddy diffusion. 
the strength of atmospheric mixing. Basically, we think there are waves generated in the troposphere that break in, in the stratosphere, gravity waves that mix the atmosphere, and Uranus has a very low internal heat source, apparently not much of that wave activity. It confines the methane to very low altitudes compared to Neptune. This is on the same, same scale. There are tons of hydrocarbons on Neptune, not very many on Uranus. In fact, Uranus is kind of a stealth object. And I'll end just saying there's a lot of processes on giant planets that are relevant to all exoplanets in general.